I, I don't know what to think of the introduction when Benjamin says that after me you can have fun. Um, but that means there's, means there's low expectations, that's good. So I can, I can only impress you. Um, I actually hate short presentations, like 20 minutes, because I would like to speak for two days. Um, so I have to choose something very specific. And I'm going to do some ideology critique. Um, uh, what, so what I want to show is a grid that uh, allows us to see that people who share the same platform in we share, uh, who share an enthusiasm for peer-to-peer -peer sharing, collaboration, may have different visions of you know what an ideal uh, business ecology or society would look like, and that when you start conceiving a project with these values in mind, designing the system that you're bringing to the world, this can have very different effects. So I'm not saying one is bad, one is good. Of course, I have my own ideas on this. Uh, yes, hello. Um, so I will, yes, I will give you my own ideas on this. So basically, this is it. Um, I'm not big in art, as you can see. Uh, I have the drawing uh, capacity as a four-year-old, so you're, you've been warned. Um, so basically, you know, my thesis in my work is that peer-to-peer -peer is inevitable. So in that sense, I, you could think that I'm a technological determinist. I think that the horizontal socialization through networks is the key factor of our time, and this will change everything. But that doesn't mean that there is only one future. Because human beings are intentional beings, we create social systems, we put DNA in those social systems, and these have effects. Uh, so we have to think about what kind of DNA do we want to put in our peer-to-peer -peer systems, because it can have very different effects. And basically, and this may sound contradictory, but just hold that in your mind, it's possible, because I'll give you an example. You have centralized control of peer-to-peer -peer systems. Sounds a bit contradictory, but it's not, not really. You have distributed control of peer-to-peer -peer systems. You can do this with a for-profit orientation, and you can do this with a for-benefit orientation. So with those, f with those four quadrants, we already have four different futures, but they're actually four different, right, they're four different presents. They exist today. All of them are being done today. So let's start with this one, which everybody knows. So this is centralized control of peer-to-peer -peer dynamics with a for-profit orientation. And well, think about Facebook. Um, Facebook allows you to do peer-to-peer -peer communication, to self-organize. Um, I have an article in my blog today about finding lost dogs in Adelaide, Adelaide in, in Australia, a very beautiful project where people you know, try to find the owners of lost dogs using Facebook, and they're doing incredibly good work using Facebook. Some other people organize a revolution with it, which I think is also a good thing. So, so you have peer-to-peer -peer dynamics. There's no doubt that at the front end of Facebook, you have peer-to-peer -peer dynamics. But what about the back end? Who is doing the design of Facebook? Um, what is happening with your private data? What is... Who is prompting you to do certain things or not? Who is making privacy protection difficult and sharing easy, right? So it's very easy to understand that even though Facebook allows you to socialize horizontally, it is actually a high hierarchy behind it. So this is what I call netarchical capitalism, the hierarchy of the network. Now, if you look at the use value exchange, in that system, it's a pretty good deal. You could say there's a social contract. Please, Facebook, let us have fun together, make things. And yeah, you know, you're advertising. Well, that doesn't really bother us. As long as you keep within certain limits, it's OK for us. This is kind of social contract. It works. It works. But if you look at the exchange value, then there you have a different picture because you have what is a platform without people? What what is that worth? Well, I would say zero. A platform without people has zero value. That means that the value that is creating that is created through Facebook is hundred percent created by us. 
the users, right? So we create 100% of the value, use value, that we find interesting from each other, but then the exchange value is extracted 100% by Facebook, right? So this is, think about, even if you're 100% if you're for capitalist society, who's gonna buy your products if this system becomes a general system? A system whereby more and more people are exponentially creating use value. Only a linear, uh, there's only a linear growth in the exchange value, so the gap is becoming bigger and bigger, and nothing of that exchange value is flowing back into the use value creating communities. This is the model that's being proposed and that we are accepting. Fine, as long as you know that this is the deal, right? This is the deal that you are accepting when you are doing this. Now, this is a bit, a bit more hot water. Uh, this is distributed capitalism. So here you have a distributed control of peer-to-peer -peer dynamics with a for-profit orientation. And this is, you know, let's call it like personal capitalism. The dream of many people is like libertarians in the US to have a world where everybody can trade and exchange on an equal basis with each other without evil big corporations and evil states. Yeah? So this is a very particular vision that is integrated into the design of social systems. Now think about Bitcoin, and I'm, I'm a fan of Bitcoin. I'm a fan of Bitcoin because it's the first globally scalable, digitally enabled, socially sovereign, post-Westphalian currency. That's a mouthful, but you know what I mean, right? The first time we have proven as humanity that we can create a global scalable currency outside of the market and outside of the state. I think this is good news. And I can see that I was in Belgium uh, last week and for first in a long time, everybody's talking about Bitcoin, which means everybody understanding that currency is not a given, but a design, an intentional design. So this is a revolution, absolutely. But let's think about Bitcoin a little bit. I recently heard, and I have to verify this, uh, but I think it's true, so uh, this is a crowdsourced appeal for very finite information, that 70% of the Bitcoins are owned by 12 individuals. The second thing that I'm saying now, this is actually proven, this is a scientific research. There is an article that did a graph analysis of the two last years of Bitcoin transactions. They all derive from one big Bitcoin infusion. So the picture that is emerging is from a small group of people who are occasionally pumping money, liberating their stock of Bitcoins, right? Um, well, how do you call 12 people controlling the money supply of a so-called peer-to-peer currency? I would call that an oligarchy, right? Um, and the reason is it's in a design because the design of Bitcoin, who is the peer in Bitcoin? The peer is the computer. Now, I'm a poor Indian peasant. How many computers do I have? I'm a libertarian capitalist who invested in PayPal. How many computers do I have, right? So in this system, somebody with 10,000 computers who can mine Bitcoins, especially in the beginning when they knew what they were doing and nobody else knew what they were doing, right? You're a super peer. Everybody else is not a super peer. So I'm just saying how you design a system, how you think about these things is gonna, this is nice, this is the fun part of my presentation. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, they they th obviously thought I wasn't interesting enough. Um, so uh, yeah, so this is Bitcoin, right? Again, I love Bitcoin, I use Bitcoin, but I'm also critical of Bitcoin because this is a design personal capitalism, distributed capitalism, you liberate the market in a certain way, but what if you don't have money? Well, if you don't have money, you can't play in the market. It's that easy. It's the difference between card surfing and Airbnb, right? And they have their uses. If I don't have money, I lost my job, but I have two rooms in my house, I'm very happy I can use Airbnb and generate an extra income. But if I'm a young student without money, I don't care about Airbnb. I need car surfing or something similar to have free lodging, right? So this is not about good and evil. It's about knowing where you are 
knowing what the underlying values are of the social systems that you're using, and knowing that Bitcoin is a political currency, right? It's designed by people who believe in a certain type of economics. It's designed to be like gold. It's designed to be speculative, a hoarding and saving cousins currency, right? Thank you, Bitcoin, for doing this, because now we can make something better. Yeah? Um, okay, so now we move in a part that I, that I, that I love the most. Um, I, I was in the sharing entrepreneur um, session, and I, I'm, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I used to be an entrepreneur myself, so I'm, if I'm judging them, I'm judging myself, right? But one of the things that was kind of general in the, in the interventions was saying, for us, the community, they are potential customers, right? So they want to turn customers into uh, community, into customers, into clients. As an entrepreneur, this is fine. This is your job. Here, you want to create community. And you want to create a livelihood for the community, right? This is different. It's a different game. So here what we have is we have a local orientation or local control of peer-to-peer -peer dynamics, but with a for-benefit orientation. This is very important. I think this is the true P2P revolution. It's that we are moving. I mean, before capitalism, it was always about producing use value, something useful. Then you give a little part to your lord for protection, and that's it. Yeah? The market was mi minor. Then we moved to a system where you produce things to sell them, right? I think that peer-to-peer -peer means that we are overturning this again. So we are going back to a system where the use value is primary. And um, I have friends from Brazil here, and I discovered that a few months ago, Curto Café. I love them because they want to make good coffee without exploiting the direct producers and make a living from it. So they do open supply chain. Where does our coffee come from? How much, how much do we pay them? You don't need a certification, just go and look. Teaching them how to burn their own coffee, so tripling their income. Open research, here are our blends, here is how you can copy them. Please copy and remix. Crowdfunded retail. People who fund their retail expansion get free coffee, get paid back in coffee. Hacking the capsules. Wonderful projects. And when I was asking them, like, well, how, what's your business model? How do you make money? Because I'm pretty anxious about that. Uh, and they got nervous, they got angry, and I said, Michel, you didn't understand anything. Because what we want to make is good coffee in, a, in an ethical way and live from making that coffee. So money, thank you, so money is just a means to an end, right? So this is a means to an end. This is the kind of peer-to-peer -peer I like more, so I'm giving you my point of view, right? So I think here we have two options. One is, I would say, the local option, and I think the local resilience movement you know, the yard sharing, urban, urban farming revolution, transition towns are all part of this peer-to-peer -peer revolution because they are using this technology and dynamics to create local resilience. And I think local resilience is very important. But it also has its limits. So this is the P2P critique on local resilience. Imagine you have your own fishing commons. You decide to regulate as a community how much fish each fisherman or fisherwoman can take, right? You can organize yourself, governance rules that protect the stock of fish. Great. Well, yes, but out just outside the territorial waters, you have these Icelandic and other super fishing factories, which are just sucking out all your fish anyway, right? So this is just to say that Yes, local is fine and important, but it's never going to be enough, right? I used to have friends in East Germany, and at, at the end of 89, they were thinking of, uh, you know, doing local agriculture. Well, you know, they got angry people from the city asking their food. So being local is never enough. You always need to work on a global level. And this is, I think, where the P2P Foundation is positioned as, you know, one of the actors where we're pluralistic, like we share, maybe a little less, uh, the sense is that this is what we want. We want a global reorientation of society around four benefit orientation. Now, you have to tell me when to stop. Oh, I have five minutes. Okay, this is what I propose as the hack to get there. 
this is this is what we are experiencing today. We have commons, commons of knowledge, commons of code, and commons of design, and they are working and growing. If you look at the use value process, open input participatory process, commons unit output, Linux, Wikipedia, it works, right? But when you look at the individual, what happens? Well, here's the rule, right? Some of the people can volunteer all of the time. They rent their PhD students or whatever, or rich, they have some inheritance, right? Or they're unemployed. Uh, some of the, so all, some of the people can volunteer all of the time. All of the, all of the people can volunteer some of the time, but not all of the people can volunteer all of the time. So this is the crucial problem. So we have a use value circulation of the commons, self-reproduction, but we cannot self-reproduce ourselves. Now what happens if you want to live from it? Well, basically you have to go to work for a company. So, we, so as we are making commons, we are still in the same system, working as labor, for a wage, etc. And so that system is not really changed. Now is that good or bad? Everybody can judge about that, but I want to change that. So I want systems that actually allow the people who have intrinsic motivation, they want to do something good for the world and they are enthusiastic about it. I want these people to be able to make a living. And this is still very, very difficult, right? And this is why many young people say, I have to be entrepreneurs. The only way to do it is to move here. And maybe they're right. Maybe there is no other solution right now. So what I propose is the following. Basically, two hacks. The first one is uh, adopting a license which I call the peer production license. It's been developed by a German guy called Dimitri Kleiner. And it kind of changes the basic rule of an open license. And it's people in the free software world don't really like what I'm going to say here, but this is the proposal. Everybody who contributes to our commons can use our commons. Everybody who contributes in general to the commons can use our commons. But people who don't contribute to our commons and are engaged in profit maximizing activity have to pay for the use of our commons. So it's kind of like a semi closure of the commons. The advantage is that you can create, and this is the second proposal, a preferential treatment for ethical companies. Ethical company forms which are structurally aligned to the commons by their own constitution. For example, the P2P Foundation Co op which is different from the P2P Foundation Foundation, we say we exist to create a sustainable living for the people contributing to the commons and to, and to help that commons. So if we have a conflict, somebody can attack us and say, you, you are not doing this, right? In a, in a for-profit, it's just the opposite. The law says you have to maximize the interest of your shareholders. If you don't do it because you want to do something good, they can attack you and, and you can go to, you know, you can be attacked for that, right? So we have to make a choice as commoners, I think, as peer producers, to work more with social economy actors, cooperative economy actors, solidarity economy actors, mission-oriented, purpose-driven social entrepreneurs, all the new forms that are emerging where the purpose is more than the profit. The profit is used, the surplus is used to create a benefit not just for the members, but for the whole society, right? So this is basically the vision. Uh, and I think once we have that, once we have this, uh, we have a coalition of ethical companies around the commons, think about what's possible. Open book accounting, open supply chains, because we are in solidarity around the commons. The level of cooperation can skyrocket. And so what we call stigmergy, the fact that now we can do immaterial production just by signaling to each other, Wikipedia, Linux. Imagine if we could that in a material field. If we can all adapt our production because we can see what is happening in our coalition, right? In our entrepreneurial coalition of ethical market entities sustaining a commons and sustaining a community. So it's, I'm making a call here and then I'll, I have 26 seconds. I'll end with that call. Uh, you know, this is a side of the peer-to-peer -peer sharing collaborative economy that we should not forget. So it's not just about 
using sharing to create businesses. It's about creating new forms of business to enable and empower much more sharing and collaboration in the world. Thank you.